Um, welcome to this introductory webinar on overview of the Global Disaster Alert and Coordinate System or GDAX. Uh, throughout this webinar we will be referring to GDAX um, and so that's the Global Disaster Alert and Coordinate System. I'm Amita Mehta from RSET and uh, we have a guest speaker today from UNOSET UNITAR. Uh, his name is Dr. Luca Taloro. He will also be talking about uh, UNOSET program that is part of GTEx. So this is the outline for today's webinar. We will start with a brief introduction of RSET and then go on to overview of GTEx then overview of UNITAR UNOSET program and demonstration of satellite map mapping system that is part of UNITAR UNOSET and then we will have a live demonstration of GDAX features for monitoring disasters. We will cover both historical disasters as well as uh, some currently going on disaster situations or events. So we'll start with the introduction to RSET, which is Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. RSET is NASA's Applied Sciences Supported Program. And the goal of the program is to empower global community through remote sensing training. And uh, the major goal here is to increase the use of earth science in decision making through training for policymakers, environmental managers, and other professionals, both in public and private sectors. RSET provides training in the multiple areas uh, shown here, uh, disasters, eco-forecasting, health and air quality, and water resources. So these are the areas uh, in which uh, detail trainings are provided and introductory training are provided as well. So there are multiple uh, types of training as I just mentioned. Fundamentals are provided which is we refer to as level zero and these are online webinars. Uh, they are always there and anyone can go and uh, view and listen to this webinar. There are slides available and recordings are available. It provides information about fundamentals of remote sensing, also satellites, sensors, and data and tools used um, in water resources management as well as land management and wildfire applications. Uh, in addition, these webinars, the fundamental uh, webinars, are sometimes prerequisite to all our advanced webinars. The next level is then basic trainings such as this one in which we introduce a subject. This could be online or it could be in-person training and um, these are for specific applications such as in this case this is for disasters. The next up is advanced training. This also could be online or in-person training. It requires uh, level one training and um, it also requires in-depth uh, focus of the topic and um, uh, so example is there would be computer exercises also given into these trainings. So these are three levels of trainings that RSET provides. So generally uh, online um, webinars are typically uh, one to two hour sessions Sometimes they are for longer time, like four to six, six weeks. Depending on the topic, it could uh, range from one to six weeks. Uh, then in-person trainings are usually two to seven days in length. They are held in a computer lab and there are presentations as well as computer-based exercises to learn um, data access. Also there are locally and regionally relevant case studies are are provided to participants who learn to access data to, to work with different case studies. Also, there is a program for trainers. Um, so this is Train the Trainers program. And so trainers who themselves are teaching in their organizations or in a group, they can um, get help from RSET to learn how to do the training. Uh, and also how to put the material together for the training. So that also is uh, provided by RSET. So far, uh, RSET has um, conducted on 36 online trainings as shown here. Uh, and there are also 45 in-person trainings. Uh, 
more than 8,000 participants have participated from more than 140 countries to these trainings and overall 1600 plus organizations participated in all the trainings and the which thematic area had how many trainings is also given here. This is a map of where RSAT has reached through the training um, and so as you can see many countries, 140 plus countries have been touched by RSAT trainings and all uh, US states uh, have taken uh, training from RSAT. So with that, we will start today's topic, which is overview of the Global Disaster Alert and Coordinate Systems, or GDAX. So what is GDAX? And here is the website that we are going to view live, but this is the source of all the disaster-related information. That's where you start. Um, this is a cooperation frame, framework between the UN, European Commission, and disaster managers worldwide. The goal is to improve alerts and information exchange uh, between all these entities such as UN, European Commission, disaster managers, data providers, also relief organizations. And the main idea here was that as a disaster sets up, in the initial phase, it is very difficult to get data. So if there is a common platform like GDAX, then people from different fields, such as people who are data providers, people who are data users, people who need information about uh, relief organ, uh, operations, they all can go to one portal and then exchange information. So that this, this was the goal of setting up GDAX, and it was initiated in 2003-04 uh, timeframe. So here are some of the um, data tools and services that complement um, GDAX. So there is International Search and Rescue Advisory Group guidelines, that is one entity, UN Disaster Assessment and Coordinate Field Handbook, International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, Standard Operating Procedures from the European Commission Mechanism for Civil Protection, International Humanitarian Partnership and Euro-Atlantic Disaster Response Coordination Center. So all these, um, they provide information to GDAX. So they are, these are some of the basic uh, GDAX tools and services. So GDAX offers uh, information about disaster alerts and impact estimation after any major disasters. And as shown here as an example, this is a, um, a flood alert in Philippines. This was a recent one in January 2017. So it provides um, rainfall information, which is shown here in color. And the area that is impacted by flooding is also uh, shown here. Uh, they also have a virtual on-site operations coordinate center, or OSOC. We OSOC, that is how it is referred to, and that provides information in near real time. Um, and we will also have a brief introduction to that. That is a, a major part of GDAX is maps and satellite imagery, which are available in, in near real time. And uh, Luca will be talking in detail about maps and satellite uh, mapping system. Uh, there is also a science portal. So behind everything that uh, GDAX provides, there is research going on or applications going on. And so the science portal provides information about uh, research going on behind uh, this alert system. All these are provided as links to the GDAX uh, website, and we will see that. So these are the basic um, uh, disasters that GDAX uh, provides alerts about. In floods, um, it provides inundation, how many deaths and displacement, this information is available. Uh, tropical cyclones, so not only uh, just the area affected by it, but also uh, winds, wind speed, uh, heavy rain um, and storm surge information, they are provided as part of the alert. Finally, earthquake and tsunamis, uh, they are also reported uh, through alert system. Intensity of earthquake is um, given, uh, 
hypocenter or epicenter, the depth also is given and population within 100 kilometers from the epicenter is given. Uh, that is vulnerability index defined and we will see that briefly uh, that shows which regions or countries are affected. All these alerts are based on various models and data uh, that go into uh, defining vulnerability index as well as uh, uh, disaster alert uh, levels and this information can be found from this website and the details of all the models uh, are found here on this website. So what we will see is we'll go through each of this uh, alert system and see how uh, things are uh, information is provided on the website. So this are, these are all the tools and services that GDAX provides. So alerts is the main thing. This is the virtual OSOC. This is the data maps and satellite imagery, and this is the science portal. So this is all what we just reviewed and all the links are available from the GDAX website. Also, there is a uh, link to about GDAX and this is where you will find a lot of information about the organization itself, participating organizations and several documents uh, can be found um, here. Also, the models used for disaster alerts can be accessed from this link as well. So, that this is, the, this is shown in here. Now, if if you go to GDAX um, page, you will see alert levels. So the first thing to know about is the, they are color coded in the sense that uh, the white color disasters are usually minor events, uh, green are moderate events, orange are potential local disasters, and red is potentially severe disasters. So now the difference, how they are defined, we will see uh, like flood, earthquake, and tsunamis and cyclones, they all have their own criteria for defining the level of alerts. But important thing to remember is that usually the way it is is that um, minor events means there are less deaths and displacement and it, then the level of deaths and displacement increases, damage increases economic and also as disaster level go up from white to red, more and more help is required. So this is how uh, the disaster levels or alert levels are defined. So starting with floods, we are going to look at um, GDAC's approach for different disaster alerts. And again, the information can be found from the links provided here. For floods, GDAX uses Dartmouth Flood Observatory and the link is provided here. This uh, portal provides a lot of information about any near real-time flood going on based on satellites as well as in situ data. And so this is part, this has been used by GTAX. And uh, the, uh, this Dartmouth Flood Observatory Global Flood Detection System or DFO GTAX Global Flood Detection System or GFDS uh, version 2 is used to map inundation from microwave radiometer data based on uh, near real-time satellites. So these are the satellites um, listed here uh, which are used for um, deriving inundation. Uh, so advanced microwave scanning radiometer. This was flying uh, for a number of years on NASA Aqua satellite and then now recently there's a Japanese satellite that carries a similar uh, scanning radiometer. NASA had a tropical rainfall measuring mission or TRIM that had a microwave imager, DMI, and so microwave data from this were used till 2015. And then the current one, uh, this is GPM or Global Precipitation Measurement, uh, has a microwave imager or GMI that is used currently, which replaced TRIM to derive inundation maps. There is a river discharge estimate uh, that is also produced based on these microwave data and more information is available from the Dartmouth Flood Observatory about these systems. But basically this information is used to define uh, where the inundation is going on um, and based on that the alerts are given. So here is an example. So when there is flood detection occurs based on um, GFDS, uh, data, so that is the microwave-based flood inundation is 
is noted. Then uh, population data are used to see how many uh, there are deaths in some area which are again reported by news media or from local agencies and uh, looking at the area and the population data it is estimated that how many people are displaced or may be displaced in that area and based on that the alert levels are given and as the map shows here um, the, these are if there are 1000 dead or 800,000 displaced it the highest alert or red alert orange is when there are 100 people dead and about 80,000 displaced, uh, displaced and then rest are uh, defined, defined as green alerts so just by quickly looking at a map um, disaster managers can see what kind of disaster uh, it is. Is it really a severe one? Then they can mobilize the resources to help that region. Next, we come to tropical cyclones. And again, um, this is the site where uh, all the information about um, data and models used to derive uh, this approach is uh, given. So information uh, used to issue cyclone alerts are given here. So rainfall, this is obtained from NOAA Nestis. Uh, this is um, actually a model-based uh, data in, in which forecasts also are available and in which in-situ data and near real-time satellite data, they are also assimilated. Uh, winds are uh, given from Joint Research Center, uh, from Euro European Joint Research Center. Uh, there is official advisory from Pacific Disaster Center that is used. Impact models based on wind speed and affected population are used. And here uh, there is a scale given. So there is wind speed uh, that ranges from say 38 to 73 uh, miles per hour. It's classified as tropical storm. And then it increases and it becomes hurricane of category 1 all the way to category 4 depending on wind speed listed here. And then population affected by uh, different um, so storms and the vulnerability is defined uh, based on human development index, uh, population and population in low elevation areas. So in addition to rainfall, wind speeds, um, these factors are used to define vulnerability to tropical cyclone. And as you can see, uh, even if there is, it's a, it's a low intensity uh, wind speed and rainfall may be less too, and, but depending on uh, if the, it is all in low elevation areas, then there could be high or medium or high vulnerability. However, based on the wind speed, it usually could be like, alert could be green. And as you can see, it is not like at always at higher speed, you have higher alert levels. It depends on the population centers, low elevation areas, as well as the way they have defined vulnerability. So um, that more information again can be found here, but basically it is the combination of uh, natural uh, rainfall and winds as well as where the storm actually is heading and where it's affecting the most based on that alert levels are given. Another thing related to tropical cyclones is storm surge and that also is information is also provided. So derived from, it's derived from hydrodynamic shallow water equation models. Again, more information can be found here. And uh, it depends on like surface pressure drop and wind water friction that uses, uh, that is used in this model to, to uh, diagnose storm surge. And then affected population by storm surge is also calculated. So extreme rainfall uh, is, again, as mentioned earlier, it's obtained from NOAA Nestis, and that is also uh, uses multi-satellite passive microwave radiometer uh, sensing data. Um, accumulated rainfall and instantaneous rainfall, they're all used to see what kind of storm surge can be there. And, and then the, the criteria are given here. So for storm surge, uh, there is red alert when it is greater than 3 meters 
and then all the orange is between one to three meters and then green alert is less than one meter. Tropical cyclone um, accumulation alert, so if there is rainfall more than 500 millimeters, it is red alert. If it is between 200 and 500 millimeters, it is orange alert, and then less than 200 millimeters is green alert. And this is instantaneous uh, rain alert, and this is mostly for flash flooding. So red alert is when there is uh, 33 millimeters uh, per hour, orange is 17 to 33 and green is less than 17. So these are again based on a number of past cases um, that the, these criteria are derived. Finally, we talk about uh, earthquakes. So magnitude and depth are obtained from uh, seismological sources. So these are in situ measurements and there are networks. Uh, they are uh, detecting uh, earthquakes, so they are used. Also, population within 100 kilometers from the epicenter um, is, is, is uh, used. And then the vulnerability, uh, it's obtained from GIS-based epicenter location and population around that area. So that defines vulnerability index. So uh, it is, the, there is earthquake alert score. And what it's calculated based on these factors, so magnitude, population density within 100 kilometers and vulnerability index which also takes care of uh, how developed that region is. So it is the national uh, or regional um, conditions that are taken into account to define the vulnerability index. B based on this, um, first of all, if the magnitude is uh, greater than 6 on Richter scale, then it is always a red alert. Um, once before, if it is magnitude is smaller than that, it is not an alert, but uh, below that, if once this is the magnitude achieved as, um, for an event, then uh, it, the depth is looked at. If it is um, around 70 kilometer depth, then it is orange alert. So it, if it is in, in between surface and 70 kilometers, it is orange alert. Whereas green alert is when it is really deep, so about 300 kilometers. So that way, uh, although magnitude is the same for um, all alerts, but if it is surface uh, or how deep it is, that defines uh, what kind of alert level will be given for earthquakes. So this is just more information about um, how, how the, it is calculated, the product, so magnitude, uh, vulnerability index and population density. So this is the, again, um, information about where the populi population density and vulnerability index are obtained from. Uh, this is the site where you will find more information. For tsunamis, uh, then it, they are triggered when earthquake is more than 6.5 magnitude and when it occurs near water. When this happens, tsunami alerts are given. And tsunami wave heights are calculated, again, using earthquake magnitude and depth from uh, Joint Research Center tsunami database. So uh, based on that, red alert is given when maximum wave height is greater than 3 meters, similar to storm surge. Um, and orange alert is when it is greater than one meter and less than that is uh, given as green alert. So the m most important information here is a magnitude of the earthquake and where it occurs. If it is closer to a water center, then tsunami uh, alerts are given. So this brings us to um, next. So we looked at the disaster alert. Now this is the next part, which is the virtual on-site operation coordinate uh, center. This is a real-time disaster information system portal. Now, as you can see, this is a um, password protected area. One has to request uh, account on OSOC. And it is mostly for disaster managers to action information. As we will see, there is some information that everyone can uh, access once you have an account. So anyone can get an account. Also, there are also, I mean, there are also 
areas which only disaster managers uh, from different governments can access. So it is, it is a special uh, portal. Uh, then there are summary reports um, and ongoing disaster reports are posted on this site. So as soon as um, there is a an disaster is occurring somewhere, uh, OSOC is populated by as much information available from local data sources, from satellites, from different services like NOAA, NASA, European uh, Union, and uh, everybody comes together, um, you know, set, and they all put information on this site for disaster managers to, to access and to act on um, uh, emergency evacuation or planning for post-disaster relief. So all that uh, occurs very quickly. So this is just an uh, information about the current flood in Philippines. So this was in, in, in January as we saw earlier. Um, it talks about uh, deaths and displacement, it talks about latest news. So so we will see this live, but once, once you go to this site and you log in through your account, then you have access to summary of this disaster. So in this case, it says uh, what kind of flood uh, it was, uh, which, what, what were the dates, how many people were killed. So here nine people were killed and 81,564 displaced. So this is more like an orange alert. And then it was uh, this. This data was reported on this day. Uh, there are references given for this. There are latest media headlines from local newspapers and local news organizations. So they are available for anyone to review. And then this is the data image and uh, other links that can be viewed uh, for this event. So this brings. This is the list. Once this list access, this brings us to satellite mapping and coordinate system. We will see this in detail uh, from Luca in a few minutes. But here is it's a UNITAR, UNOSET-led uh, uh, effort. It includes NASA and European Space Agency satellite data, as we will see in a few minutes. Uh, it is a GIS-based tool for satellite imagery uh, for specific disaster events. And this also, access to SMCS also requires registration. It provides past and near real-time imagery for an event and also offers baseline maps, situation-specific maps, damage assessment maps, and weather forecast maps. So all these uh, information is available from the SMCS. So uh, again, uh, these are the NASA satellites used in uh, GDAX SMCS, and we will also see uh, which European satellites and other commercial satellites used by UNOSAT. So GPM, a global precipitation measurement um, satellite that has a multi-satellite um, product, it's called iMERGE. This is routinely used to look at storms and floods, and um, so GPM Microwave data, they are used for deriving inundation by GFDS, which is the flood detection system. And the, here is an example shown uh, for rainfall accumulation over Mozambique. And this was uh, in March, um, April 2016. And one can see how there were, there were centers where there were rain, extreme rainfalls occurred. These were the areas where there was rainfall related damage as well as uh, flood related damage. Next satellite from NASA used are Terra and Aqua and also Landsat satellite. These three satellites are uh, routinely used um, mostly for land and snow cover data. Also, um, as you can see here, volcanoes, wildfires, uh, they are also um, reported by GDAX by using the satellite imagery. Now, in official alerts, when you go on the page, you will see either floods, cyclones, and earthquakes. But based on satellite data, there are additional alerts or information provided uh, about, say, volcanoes and wildfires. So example shown here, the first one is from Landsat image. This was collected on 24th January 2017, and this shows 
uh, fires in Mosul um, in Iraq, and you can see the white areas they show where the fires and smoke are. So the satellite data show uh, some of these uh, e events. And this example here is from Terra satellite MODIS instrument, and that shows puffs of ash from the Colima volcano in Mexico, and this was also recently in, in January uh, 2017. So satellite images also provide information, uh, somewhat qualitative, but they can provide information about uh, volcanoes and wildfires and smokes. Also, they provide information about cold and um, heat and cold waves, um, snow cover, these are also provided by satellite data. So they are also part of uh, GDAX uh, overall alert systems. So this brings us to next section and this will, I will hand it over to um, Luca Deloro and he is going to first start uh, talking about UNITA UNOSAT program and then he will also provide a demonstration of our satellite mapping system that we just saw uh, briefly. So with that, I will hand it to Luca. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Luca De Loro, and um, I'm now acting head for training capacity development and operational disaster mapping at the Operational Satellite Application Program of the United Nations Institute for Training Research. Today, my 20 minutes lecture will cover the following topics as shown here in the outline on the screen. I will be presenting an overview of UNITAR Operational Satellite Application Program. I will cover shortly UNOSAT Humanitarian Rapid Mapping Framework, and I will illustrate two operational case studies based on recent disasters and conflicts. I will be then provide you an overview and a demo about the GDAC satellite mapping coordination system. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to describe UNOSAT operational activities, including satellite derived analysis in support of international humanitarian operations. Describe how the GDAC satellite mapping coordination system, SMCS, supports data sharing and satellite mapping coordination during major disasters. The United Nations Institute for Training Research, UNITAR, is a principal training arm of the United Nations whose mission is to develop capacity to enhance global decision making and to support country level actions for shaping a better future. The Institute's core functions are to design and deliver innovative training, to facilitate knowledge and experience sharing, to conduct research on and pilot innovative learning strategies, to advise and support governments, UN and other partners with technology-based, knowledge-related services. UNITAR has nine programs that deliver training and capacity development in specific focused areas. To know more about UNITAR, just you can browse the website www.unitar.org. UNOSAT is an operational program of UNITAR serving the UN, international organization, and UN member states. Fully dedicated to satellite imagery analysis, application of geospatial information technologies, training capacity development. We are operational since 2001, and our headquarters is in Geneva, and we have three outposted offices, one in, in Jamina, Chad, another one in Nairobi, Kenya, and in Bangkok, Thailand. UNOSAT offers geospatial support services and knowledge transfer through the following main pillars. Analysis and mapping for both onset disasters and conflict situations, and training in capacity development. UNOSAT has uh, more than a decade of practical experience in the design, development, and delivery of innovative training solutions on the uses and application of geospatial information technology tailored to strengthen the technical capacity of master students, technical experts, disaster managers, and decision makers to support emergency response, humanitarian operations, flood and drought management, water resource management, environmental monitoring, and sustainable development goals monitoring. 
Our target audience are professionals from national governments, regional and international organizations, UN agencies, academia, and private sectors. In terms of operational mapping and satellite analysis, UNOSAT provide imagery analysis during humanitarian emergencies, including natural disasters and conflict situations. We provide national governments and humanitarian actors, including the UN agencies, maps, JSRED, data, statistics, and reports. Several hundred thousand square kilometers of satellite images from commercial and scientific sensors are acquired and processed by, U by UNOSAT every year. UNOSAT processes and analyzes optical and radar data ranging from very high resolution, 50 centimeter, to low resolution, 1 kilometer, according to our operational requirements. As we can see here on the screen, we get access and we process very high resolution imagery, true color images, false color images to detect vegetation and water, but also digital elevation models radar imagery, and also other grid data coming from satellite sensors, as for example, to extract indicators like precipitation, soil, water, or temperatures. I will be covering now, and then we will, I'll be listing here in this, in, this, uh, in this slide, what are the benefits of using satellite imagery and image response. First of all, I will say the scale flexibility. There are many different optical and radar sensors orbiting the Earth capable to provide evidence-based information at global, regional, and local scale. Daily to weekly image requisition, satellite sensors are capable to monitoring sudden and slow onset disasters, as well as complex emergencies and crises worldwide. Multiplicity of spectral bands and spatial resolutions which allows fine discrimination of physical and spectral characteristics of objects and features on the ground. This is very useful, for instance, to assess the impact and damages to buildings, key infrastructures, and transportation network. Absence of political or physical limits. Image acquisition can be planned in advance to cover thousands of square kilometers. Ideal to get information regarding remote, inaccessible, and political sensitive areas. Information objectivities and evidence-based is also very important. Satellites record what actually exists on the ground. Nobody can argue that information has been omitted or changed. This may provide evidence-based information needed for negotiations. How do we normally assess exposure and impact to population and infrastructures following a major flood event? First, we need to collect pre and post event images covering flood affected areas. Here, for example, displayed on the screen, we have a cloud free radar image. By looking at this, uh, at this image, we can clearly see a dark area surrounding the main river channel. Extraction of flood water can be easily done by performing some spatial analysis using JS softwares. As you can see here now, we clearly um, identify the extent in red, flood water extent, and in blue, existing water, water bodies, lakes, and rivers. Preliminary estimation of population in populated places that might be affected by the flood can be then performed by simply, by, sim by, sim by simply intersecting available baseline data, such as graded based spatial demographic data sets, and other re relevant georeference data sets, such as populated places, transportation network, with satellite derived flood extent. Combining these two layers in HIS, then we can easily retrieve statistics about square kilometers, uh, kilometers of um, transportation network likely damaged, estimated number of people living within affected areas, and number and location of towns, villages, and cities within flood-affected areas. 
following a major earthquake, for example, it's really important and needed to conduct building damage assessments to estimate the number of building damage. To perform these activities, it's important to acquire and to collect very resolution imagery before and after the event. In this case, we can see on the left, in the, on the screen here, a previous event satellite image at the resolution of 50, of 50 centimeters. We can clearly detect it, detect, detecting and see buildings. Here we have a post-disaster post image collected after the earthquake at the same resolution covering the same areas. By visual inspection and visual detection, we can clearly see that in these areas, within the, circle, the circles, we, have, we can see that there are some damages in the building structures. We have buildings that have been collapsed. And so the analyst, they can easily assess the different level of building damage, from moderate damage to severe to destroyed. By doing this uh, assessment, is it possible then to provide satellite-based damage assessment for cities and towns affected by either typhoons or earthquakes, for example. For, for example. <clears throat> How does UNOSAT operate in a real humanitarian context? As explained earlier, UNOSAT provides satellite image analysis to UN agencies, international organizations, and UN member states in support of international humanitarian response which requires a multi-sectoral international response that goes beyond the mandate or capacity of any single agency or ongoing UN country program. International humanitarian response operations carried out within the humanitarian program cycle framework is a coordinated series of actions undertaken by UN and country teams to help, prepare for, manage, and deliver international humanitarian response. As shown here, the humanitarian program cycle has four main stages. Phase one, within 72 hours, is where preliminary scale, scope, and severity is no of, a, of a disaster or a crisis is normally assessed by performing secondary data analysis. Then we have phase two, three, and four, spanning from two weeks up to six weeks in these phases, different level of field assessments, primary data collection, are carried out by the national authorities in coordination with the UN country teams. UNOSAT supports the entire humanitarian program cycle with the provision of satellite analysis according to different, da different data and information needs. Most common satellite derived, uh, derived products are location and preliminary situation maps. Situation analysis maps, preliminary impact and damage analysis, and detailed building damage assessment. UNOSAT produces satellite derived analysis following all types of major disasters and conflict worldwide. I'm now going to show an example of products delivered by UNOSAT in support of Hurricane Matthew in October 2016 and ongoing Syria conflict. Hurricane Matthew, a Category 4 storm, struck southwestern Haiti on the 4th of October, causing widespread damage, flooding, and massive population displacement. UNOSAT was immediately triggered by the United Nations Office's Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA, to support with satellite-derived analysis. First analysis released by UNOSAT within the first few hours was a preliminary estimation of population living within sustained wind zones, especially under the under 120 kilometers per hour sustained zone and 90 kilometers per hour. A second product or analysis that are produced by UNOSAT was a preliminary estimation of population living within high, high accumulated precipitation areas. Between the 4th and the 5th of October, we used to estimate population numbers, global data from global precipitation measurement. We also estimate the number of people living within medium and high risk flood areas based on preliminary studies in Haiti. 
Then, in coordination with other satellite mapping groups, UNOS has started performing satellite aerial analysis using high resolution imagery to assess number of building damage, location of road obstacles, and spontaneous people gathering sites. We can see here in the map four areas of interest where satellite imagery were acquired right after the, the hurricane, the tropical cyclone. UNOS had performed building-by-building building damage analysis, and within these four areas of interest, we detected more than 40,000 buildings damaged, almost 1,500 people gathering sites, and more than 500 locations with access constraints. Since the, the conflict in Syria started in March 2011, the humanitarian community requires information to plan efficient delivery of humanitarian assistance to affected population and people in need. Due to the accessibility constraints in conflict areas, UNITAR UNOSAT has been requested by different humanitarian actors to monitoring conflict situation using satellite imagery and provide evidence-based analysis. UNOSAT has therefore established a dynamic humanitarian monitoring system to provide satellite-based damage analysis and refugee and NIDPs mapping and monitoring support to different agencies involved in the, sorry, in, the, in the Syria crisis. Here I will show in the in, in these slides a few examples of unit of products and unit analysis done to support humanitarian operations in Syria. By acquiring you know, high resolution imagery over time of a specific location, we were able to monitor the access to markets. We can see, for example, here. In, uh, in, uh, in the middle of the image, we have uh, a market, Suhal market, and in the image acquired on the 6th November, this market was, was damaged. We were able also to detect burning oil, oil pipelines, vehicles clustered around Kobane's Cub border crossing point in northern Syria. And then with the multiple acquisition over time, with the acquisition of satellite imagery over time, we were also able to monitor al Zatri refugee camp in Jordan, hosting approximately now, today, 80,000 Syrian refugees. Another analysis done by UNICEF was to perform, over time, since 2011, detailed damage assessment over several cities in Syria. We can see here spatial distribution of building damage density in several, in several Syrian, Syrian cities. To know more about UNOSAT products, you can browse and then go to, to our website, www.unita.org slash UNOSAT slash maps. I will run now a short demo to show and explain major functionalities of the satellite, the GDAC satellite mapping coordination system maintained and implemented by UNOSAT. As explained earlier, the Global Disaster, Disaster Alert and Coordination System, GDAX, is designed to alert the international community in the event sudden onset disasters that might require international assistance and to facilitate international information exchange and coordination in the first phase of a disaster. GDAX provide the services provided by GDAX are automatic disaster alerts, automatic impact estimation, real-time coordination platform for disaster managers, satellite mapping coordination system, and a community of practice. To access the satellite mapping coordination system, we just need to navigate on the GDAX main page here, main interface. We click on data maps and satellite imagery. Here we have uh, several sections, maps, that are connected to virtual OSOC, but we have also the satellite imagery. But by clicking here, SMCS, we directly access our platform. Here, here it is. So what we have here, we can navigate easily. We have a, an overview map where we can just zoom in and zoom out. And then we have here three main tabs. 
disaster event status, GTEx report, and GTEx live web map. Those are the main functionalities as part of the satellite mapping coordination system. So the, let's have a look now here, the disaster event status. <clears throat> This is the satellite mapping coordination. So here we can have, we can easily see what are the, the, the events that some satellite mapping coordination took place. Archived, active, and both. So we can look into the archived one. But we can only look into the, the active one. And for example, now there is an active uh, events, so meaning that uh, um, we can look into information and see who does what and where in terms of satellite image analysis. We can see here, for example, the event status is active. The event type is a flood, FL. This is the date. This is what set it up on the 18th of January. Um, the requester was UNOSAT and is coordinated by UNOSAT. This is heavy rainfall in uh, several Mozambique provinces, right? So this is one, and then we will go back to see a bit more uh, different option and functionality, and functionality in, inside the disaster event status. Then we have also the GDAX report. So basically GDAX report is a, a service that summarizes current satellite mapping activities in, of interest of GDAX to GDAX stakeholders. And it, uh, those are issued weekly by UNOSAT and based on contribution from map producing entities and GDAX partners. Here we can get the information about what's happening, for example, now in Ethiopia. And then we have uh, the GDAX live web maps that provide an up-to-date overview of an emergency, bringing together imagery, analysis from different organizations into a single place, allowing for a more holistic view of an emergency event. We will be looking into, a, into this functionality in a second. Let's go back now to the disaster event status. And I would like to show you, since we presented a bit the case of Aidi and uh, uh, Tropical Cyclone, Henrik and Matthew. So let's go to Aidi. Here we can zoom into a specific country or a geographic areas. And then, I can click and I have some information here. I have a glide number, which is uh, an event uh, identifier. And then I have some information about this activation, what we call an activation, meaning that there is a request of satellite imagery support. Here we have uh, the, the event status, the type, the date, and then the requester and the description. Let's go and then we click here, view event. So we go inside and what, we zoom in, in it a bit. So the information that is possible to access and that is, that is displayed now on the, on the map viewer here is basically areas you can see that we have over the western part of Haiti some polygons here, rectangles. So basically these rectangles with different color coding, you have red, orange, and green. They provide you know, area of interest, area where satellite imagery will be collected and analyzed by different satellite mapping groups. So here we can see clearly that we have an area that has been now completed, meaning that the imagery has been acquired analysis is performed and shared with the humanitarian actors. So we have here current status is delivered, analyzed by UNOSAT, green meaning that is, the, is completed. And then you can see also here the activity that was performed, the analysis that is damage assessment. Then we can just move it to another area, for example, that was done, this one, um, for example, is done by the European Commission de Copernicus, which is another satellite mapping group. And you can see here that the, that the, the damage assessment, the analysis was completed. So 
basically you can browse this basic information is a coordination tool that provides um, users humanitarian actors in the fields with an understanding about areas that would be covered by or that are covered by satellite analysis who does what and where in terms of satellite analysis so different agencies working and, and performing satellite analysis can better coordinate amongst them and avoid duplication of efforts. So if an area is already selected, meaning that that area will be analyzed by specific agencies that will be doing a specific analysis as shown here. This is another example. We have uh, the activity was a uh, satellite detected waters, the sensor use was radar set two, the dates, and then also another activity was done, damage assessment using play yards and war you two. Right? So this is one functionality that we have. Now we can go back here to our main um, page. And uh, I will be uh, we show you now how it works with the, what are the live web maps. Here we have these icons. And if you look again, if you click here on this one over 80, we can see that we can access view map. We can access an SV service, a live web map. So again here, the live web map provides this really interesting tool because it provides an overview um, of what is happening within a country where some international maintenance support is uh, it's ongoing. Is bringing together image analysis from different organizations. So we can see here that it's normally known for those that are familiar with the with JS. Um, we have a layer that we can open. You know, you can open. I see different data layer that are displayed. So here, let me just now deactivate this one here, and we can see that we can zoom out, and we have a first layer. So you see that we have the sustained wind zones and um, of uh, tropical cyclone Matthew. So we see that here that is the zone at 120 kilometer, kilometer per hour, and those the, the areas where uh, satellite image analysis was performed, as shown before in the in the in the satellite mapping coordination tools. But now here we can also retrieve some more data. So we have uh, different options here. We have pictures, but if you can zoom, and uh, here we can also navigate. We have also field pictures that can be accessed. And here we can zoom to different layers. And then we can see here that we can get access to all the building damage points, meaning that uh, you know, in this area was performed satellite derived damage assessment, building by building damage assessment. And here we can see whole you know, the location of buildings that have been assessed as damaged. This can be downloaded, it can be shared as a service, as WMS, WMS service. And then we can also access IDPs, for example. We have the icon here where there were, you know, location of um, gathering, spontaneous gathering sites. People, meaning that people that had uh, their, um, you know, house or the building was destroyed, they were just, you know, sitting and waiting, you know, outside the building for, uh, you know, to get some relief, tents, water, etc., etc. We have also the road obstacle here that are shown, so we can get access, and so people can navigate through the, you know, over the entire web map. But the interesting that you can also get access to pictures. If they click here, I think we have a picture. Uh, let's see. No, I cannot show. But uh, let me see. And I need to go to another location to better display a picture. Here, yeah, this is Jeremy Town. And now here we can see clearly that we have the building damage point displayed. Locations. IDPs, but then we have also this icon is is UN assign and picture that have been collected in the fields and that are displayed 
now here I cannot unto the unto now it not is not active. Never mind. Those are the pictures that can be displayed now uh, are not is not possible for ah here. See it you here. And then here you have different level of bookmarks. And then you know is a is a collaborative platform because the you know all the different satellite mapping group can share their own information, but also field actors can share uh, reports and pictures about what's happening on the ground and what is the situation. In the future, there will be also there will be hopefully improved where people in the field can request specific analysis satellite analysis over specific areas. I'm now going to navigate back to the, to the main interface. So here again, we have, you know, from, you know, from the GDAX um, main page, I can browse. I will just repeat again how to access, sorry, how to access the service. We are just we go to Google, for example, GDAX. Here you have data maps and satellite imagery, and then here you get SMCS, and then we have these three main functionalities. The satellite mapping coordination, that provides a communication and, 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 um, and coordination, a, a communication and coordination platform where organization can monitor and inform stakeholders on their completed current and future mapping activities in terms of satellite analysis, the GDAX report, just narrative about what, what is happening in, within the countries in terms of uh, satellite imagery analysis, and then to the GDAX live web maps to access into a single place, access imagery analysis from different organizations that are combined into different data layers. So this brings to the last part of today's session. Uh, we're going to see a demonstration of GDAX features for monitoring disasters. So what we're going to do is tour the website and see how to look at not only uh, current disasters, but also look at past archived disasters and get available information on them. And uh, we'll also have a brief overview of virtual OSOC that we have been talking about. Uh, we will see how to get uh, satellite images when they are available and also damage assessment news when they are available. So with that, we will start with the GDAX website. So here is the main website. As soon as you go in, on the left side you will see latest disaster alerts. Uh, all the alerts are shown here, and these are the symbols. So earthquakes, uh, cyclones, and floods, they are shown here, as well as the colors, green and orange, they show the level of alerts. Uh, the less um, severe are green, moderate are orange, and severe are uh, most severe are red. So and these disasters, uh, they occurred in last four days. And they're also shown here on the map. One can click and get more details about them as well. Or you can click on any of this event and get the same information. Then there is virtual OSOC that we will see at the end. Uh, this is more or less for um, people who are disaster managers. Uh, it's really, there's a portion of VOSOC which is accessed only by permission. Uh, everyone else can have uh, access through um, by setting up an account. You can get an account, and once you log in, you can get some information, uh, news and summary, and some information you can share through uh, this OSOC. Also, there is GDAX news and reports. Uh, they are available from this site. When you go down, you will see that the disasters in past four days are there, but 
in addition, there are archived alerts are there. You can search for alerts. And then there are information about uh, thresholds and models and uh, about earthquake selection. So the information can be obtained from these links. Additional documents such as GDAC satellite mapping overview um, is available here. Uh, satellite maps, global flood initiative. Uh, this information can be found here. There is resources for developers. And uh, uh, there is uh, some uh, view of operation rooms, the, how things are done. So some information can be obtained from these documents. Um, more importantly, there are mobile apps. By subscri subscribing to this uh, apps, one can get near real time disaster alerts. Um, different formats are available for information. And uh, there is a uh, social media uh, access to GDAX alerts. There is also a feedback link here. So uh, GDAX website, uh, if you want any feedback or any more information, here is the link to uh, interact with them. So at this point, I also want to mention that uh, GDAX uh, alert system and the web interface that we see here, they are constantly evolving. And periodically, they make changes. Um, so all the algorithms and models used to uh, decide threshold levels, they also are continually improved as more data come in or more research is done. So these um, information uh, are periodically updated. And as it happens that in near future, there may be a new a web interface, there may be also a new uh, satellite mapping coordinate uh, system also may have new interface. So all this information will be there, but there may be different packaging. And when that happens, we will be providing updates. But today, we're just going to go over some of the features that are available now. So uh, to look at uh, archived alerts, click on this link. And this will get you this global map. All the alerts you see now are the current alerts. But here, there are um, events that you can find by date and type and impact. Once you click on that, you will get uh, all kinds of alerts here. Uh, if you, you can pick any one, or you can, uh, if you don't pick any, all of them are displayed. But for simplicity, for example, we are going to start with floods. Then you can choose start and end date, uh, during which you want to know about the disaster alerts. So for example, uh, we're going to pick 1st February 2016 to 1st February 2017. And uh, we're going to look at all alerts that occurred during this time. So all floods uh, with all uh, alert levels uh, will be displayed. Now, you can also choose by country or severity, uh, population, and latitude longitude. But if you choose just by type of disaster, uh, all this information will also be displayed. On the right hand side, you can see the dates when um, these disaster, disaster alerts became more reliable. So uh, say after uh, August of 2002, it is earthquakes. After May 2011, it's cyclones. And for floods, it is uh, January 2006. After these dates, uh, all the alerts are reliable. Once you pick that, you click, click Apply. And you will see that it is trying to find all the alerts between the date that we specified. And uh, depending on how many users are there, uh, you will, in a couple of seconds, a few seconds, a map will be displayed, which shows all the flooding events that occurred during this time period. And you can see most of them during the last year were green with a few orange uh, flood types. Not only you can have this inter interactive map, but you will also see a list of most of these flooding events. And not only the flooding, flooding events, but the country they impacted, and magnitude, dates, um, impacts in terms of how many deaths and how many people were displaced. This is also shown here. And latitude, longitude. This is more for GIS, that this is the central latitude longitude uh, that is assigned for this um, uh, event ID that is unique uh, for each of each disaster. Also, I want to note here that the, for flood, magnitude is also based on the uh, global flood detection system microwave scheme that they have used. Uh, depending on past data, uh, with respect to that standard deviation of uh, extent of 
flood is calculated and based on that flood magnitude is decided. So what we're going to do is uh, view a, an example of a couple of uh, a flood here and see what information can be obtained. Uh, so we're going to pick a flood here on Peru that occurred in January. It was a recent flood um, and it killed 14 people and uh, so this is a green uh, flood alert in Peru. If you click on that link, it will take you to the information or summary of the event. It shows if there is information available about the magnitude, it provides that. Um, it provides dates, how many people were killed and how many were displaced, uh, if that information is there. Um, and the news when it was entered into GDAX. So here is the area which was impacted by flood, this particular flooding event, and that is shown in the map. Um, there are latest media news or headlines are available in this uh, about the event or around the event. And as you go down, here you will see data, images, other links and services and documents for this particular event that is compiled by GDAX. So once you click on the list, you will be taken to a page where overview of resources available in GDAX for this event, if you will find that. Now, it is important to note that the resources types are listed on top, and then here all this information is given. Sometimes not all information is available for all events. Whatever is available, uh, those resources you will be able to see when you click on them. So um, more in, you can see all, and then it will display everything. There are several uh, specific formats like GeoJSON and JSON, which you use with Java. You can use HTML and XML uh, files with um, JS, um, text files for more information. Uh, you can look at images that shows, say, indicative flood map based on passive micro remote sensing, which is from GDAX, uh, GFDS. If you click on that, uh, it shows on Peru where areas are flooded, especially the red areas shows there is more flooding going on over there. So overview um, map also is given as PNG here that shows the extent uh, over which this flooding is talked about. This data is from NASA, this is from TRIM satellite and this shows uh, accumulated rainfall from NASA data. So it shows where there is more rainfall accumulated, especially in the southern central part of Peru and also near the border of uh, Peru and Bolivia. So this indicates where higher rain was based on that and elevation it uh, shows where more flooding would be. Again, this shows where the area are um, more flooded and then there's also a joint uh, research center uh, provides seven day rain and this will be also available from um, in TIFF image so you, you will have to look at uh, with GIS but that is available. So these are images. Uh, you can also specifically search for say GRC or NASA and whatever resources are available uh, you can see. So we saw the trim image just a few minutes ago um, you can see MODIS um, flood map and we will, this is two day composite as shown here. You can try and look at that. It is, it is a KMZ file that displays on a Google Earth and that shows uh, areas where there may be uh, surface inundation going on. So here over Peru, if you zoom in, um, there are areas you will see when you zoom in where there is surface inundation you can observe. So sometimes when there are clouds present, MODIS cannot see the surface, but wherever uh, it is cloud free and the surface is inundated, it is indicated by the red areas like that. So by zooming in, uh, in this KMZ file and Google Earth uh, map, uh, you can decide where the flooding is going on. So this information is available for um, many flood events. Similarly, there is a three-day composite of MODIS file, 
And so the, uh, whatever resources is available for this event are usually listed um, in these resources. So uh, disaster managers or people who are pl planning relief or people who are local organizers who are planning evacuation or where to send help, uh, all these uh, resources can be useful. So with this, I we can go back and look at uh, one more we'll look at say cyclones for the same last year period when you apply you will see all the cyclones that occur during uh, February 16 to February um, 2017 you can see a lot of cyclones occurred during this some really severe and the example here we're going to see is going to be a red alert tropical cyclone Verda that occurred over India and it uh, affected a lot of people about close to 10 million people were affected by this um, and so this is what we can see what information is available again just by clicking on the event uh, this is from JRC you can see the track as well as you can see clouds associated with this cyclone it, uh, here the summary is given here um, it, it had a maximum wind speed of 139 kilometers per hour the date um, in, when it was effective or when it impacted uh, the area. Uh, there was population affected uh, by category one wind speed was higher than 10 million in this case because there was a large area, densely populated coastal area uh, was affected by this and was very high vulnerability storm again because it was close um, to the very high density population area. and. Um, it has extreme rainfall event, like potential rainfall calculated based on observed by several micro satellites that uh, gave alert about extreme rainfall. Um, so in addition to wind, a lot of rain accumulation occurred and uh, because of that flash flooding as well. And storm surge, so maximum storm surge height for this storm was 0.6 meters um, in, in Teru Nattam, India. And this has this information about the cyclone itself, the area impacted. There are, if you click on this, it also shows um, some news and situation, or heavy rain, where it occurred. Um, and so information about this event uh, can be found like this. Um, there, is, there is, uh, References, so this is Joint Typhoon Warning Center that has a lot of information about this storm. So one can go to that site and uh, find more information. There is latest media headline um, about how this storm impacted or like in this case, there was a cricket game that uh, practice had to be rescheduled. That's a big news here for India. Similarly, if you go down, you can go to data, images, links, uh, services and documents. Again, as in, uh, we saw in the flood case, here also you have all the resources listed on the top. Um, not always all the information is available, but whatever is available is when you click on it or if you see thumbnail down here, you will be able to get that. So there are, there are data also available sometimes. In this case, you will see that there are uh, storm surge event results. So there are model results are available. If you go to the directory, uh, you will be able to download data. There, all the data can be downloaded. They're in different formats related to storm surge. Um, if you look at this, there are GIS, data impact and analysis. Um, and If you go to images, you will see this the image uh, that shows clouds that we just saw. That is a map of extreme rainfall that is from GRC. And this shows along the track where there is extreme rainfall. So these are the alerts, but it shows all the way uh, over the track. This is the map of extreme rainfall from NOAA, this shows exactly where the storm, when it hit the uh, land, uh, how, how much rain. So this is the extreme in millimeters per hour that you can see here.
similarly, this, that this, that this is the also the area impacted by um, wind and rain. Uh, this is the weather by UNICES. Again, this is the weather alert system. Here is the storm surge information available. Um, okay, so this shows the storm surge information. Here is the storm surge height. This is the time in hours. And this is the model simulation that shows as storm starts moving, um, eventually as it gets close to the coastal region, you will see where the storm surge hits um, and the height can be seen. So that information can be obtained here. Also, it shows the um, cyclone storm surge as it is passing through how it is impacting uh, sea level height and the storm surge is shown here. So for cyclone, you can find all this information. Um, you can also, again, uh, there are links to, uh, this is Australian Meteorological um, Society, that is a um, WMO, there is European um, uh, Monitoring, uh, this is NASA, this is Humanitarian Coordination, Office of Coordination for Humanitarian Affairs. So whatever information is available from different agencies about this particular disaster can be accessed uh, for uh, by this website. So again, and, and very quickly, we're just going to look at um, earthquake also to see what kind of information is available. So just for one year period, we are searching for uh, different earthquakes. And as you can see, you can see all the earthquakes that occur during this time. And um, just as an example, this is the one that occurred um, on 31st of uh, January in Japan. And uh, we can click on that and see uh, what information is available. So it shows where it occurred. It has summary with magnitude of 4.6 magnitude. Depth was 18 kilometers. So it was very closer to surface. Um, it, it had um, about 14,000 people within 100 kilometers of the epicenter. And uh, so this also has a unique identifier. You can look at this in the catalog. All the latest headlines are given, and all the resources, again, can be found by clicking on the, on the list link. And you can see that, um, again, these are different formats uh, that you can uh, access. This is the UNOSEP maps by country. By clicking on that, one can get to tsunami-related standing water bodies in Sendai. But this is any information of that area available will be um, obtained from um, this UNOSET map. This is the USGS earthquake report. It provides a summary of uh, the, the event, uh, that uh, what the magnitude and depth, uh, time, etc. And additional information can also be found uh, from this site. There is there is an impact report that one can look at through this, uh, which is more or less the summary, how many people are affected, uh, population uh, centers, population near epicenter, how, how many people are distributed in what distance. Um, so this is the uh, region, like province, and then how many people. So there's some detail uh, can be obtained from this. There is a um, sea level um, information also for tsunami. So it, it, it talks about um, still the, if there is tsunami detected, then it will be shown here. If it is not detected, then you will not see any data there. Um, there is a shape map report as well as uh, if there is tsunami impact, then there is tsunami impact report given. There is population density map for the same. There is, um, so 
here is what you, you here is where you will see how population density is. Here's the shape map where you will see information summary. If the map is available, then you will see it. Otherwise, it, it will just give you the summary of the event. Sometimes after the event, these resources are populated. Uh, and um, so this is, I'm just trying to show you the major resources that one can go and access. So this is all the past error that we just saw. And we can go back to the main site and try and see what currently is going on. That is the earthquake in Philippines. Uh, and that's 10th February. Uh, tropical cyclone Tino, that's in Mozambique. Uh, this is um, it is an Indian Ocean island. There is Carlos, uh, that is on 11th of February. And this is actually currently going on. There are floods going on in Australia, Malawi, and Indonesia as well. So just to see quickly what information is available about this storm over Mozambique, one can click on it and see where the what information are available. So this is again uh, showing cloud map and the extent of this uh, cyclone here. The summary is provided here. You see tropical cyclone, uh, it's a maximum wind speed is this. Uh, then uh, it is the, this is the date. Population affected by category one wind speed is this. Uh, about a quarter of a million. And then the vulnerability is again high. The storm surge or maximum height uh, point eight meter in in Marivate, uh, Mozambique. And here is where you can see the storm track as well as the area impacted by the storm. The media news is provided here and more information are available uh, through data and link here. And um, so quickly looking at the images, one can see the cloud image, you can see this maximum uh, extreme rainfall uh, image from NOVA. This is um, again showing the related to the storm where the maximum rainfall centers are uh, when the and in even in the in the sidebands you can see where the uh, more rainfall is going on. So this is again from NOAA. Um, there is a GRC provides information about the storm track as well as uh, where the impact is, winds and rain. It can be shown uh, in this here. It also shows the storm surge. Here you can see how the storm starts and it goes to coast, near coast, how the um, storm surge is changing. This is the height. Um, and you can see how storm surge are, are occurring because of um, because of this storm. 